You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussion, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Loft. Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, here on a... Tuesday evening, joined by David Augustine. He is a returning guest. I'm going to bring him on here in just a moment. We spoke last time about Matthias Shaven and his handbook on Catholic dogmatics, and that's what we're going to continue today. But we're going to focus especially on Christology and maybe a little bit of Mariology. But again, going to be bringing David Augustine on here. Coming up next. David, it's great to have you back on. How are you? Oh, pretty good. How are you doing this evening, Michael? Doing good. I keep wanting to call you Dr. Augustine. I, I know you're in the process of becoming Dr. Augustine. How far along are you? So I'm in a very liminal phase right now. I successfully defended my dissertation last Thursday. Okay. I'm 100% oh, nice. in the course requirements, but I don't oh, technically nice. receive the diploma until May 15th. May 15th? Why don't they just go ahead and say, you know what, we're, we're going to give it to you now. Well, at least, you know, give you the privileges of it and we'll give you the diploma later. That's, fair <laughs> That's a, a liminal phase, right? Yeah, right. Well, I'm going to call you Dr. Augustine just because of that. So <laughs> I don't care that you didn't get it yet. You you passed the you defended your thesis. I mean, your dissertation. Correct. Yeah, that's that's the end of it. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, How was that, that, by the way? It was great. It was so I, I was nervous beforehand because mm. you know, I'm defending my doctoral dissertation. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is I really do know the material that I was discussing there. I spent right. several years writing that book, and uh, I just I went in and you know, you know, I'm it's like a public speaking or going on a show or anything else. Mm -hmm. I'm nervous mm -hmm. for about the first five minutes, and then I start to have sure. fun. And that's exactly how it was with my defense. I was nervous for the first five minutes, and then I had fun. Did Did they ask anything that just really tripped you up? No, not really. They, um, well, my, my topic is just on the sacrificial, certain sacrificial motifs in yeah. Stephen's dogmatics in particular in his Christology, what we're discussing tonight, these bad yeah. volumes. And they, they asked me to bring him into dialogue with a couple of like modern figures who, or more modern figures who discuss sacrifice in various ways, like Emmanuel Kant and Rene Girard. And so we kind of spent some time navigating around that because, you know, competing worldviews, right? Right, right. Yeah. Well, sounds good, though. I, I uh, look forward to that. Uh, and, and so there will be an award ceremony, I, I presume. Yeah, it looks like we're at CUA's having it, I think, at FedEx Field on May 15th. You know, so we have enough room with the, on May 15th. And I'm incredibly grateful for that because I was actually going to come back later and walk, you know, get my diploma, but walk across the stage because, darn it, I just finished 20 right. years of a diploma. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So. I hear you. Well, congratulations. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Well, you know, we're diving in again to the handbook of Catholic dogmatics. You brought it up, but uh, yeah. everybody can kind of see it there as well. In fact, you have two volumes there. Mine is uh, the book five, part two on soteriology. Yeah. Uh, what, what was book uh, 5.1 about? Remind me again. 5.1, both deal with Christ, although there's quite a bit of Mariological material in the second volume as well in 5.2. 5 1, it deals primarily with Christ's constitution. Mm. You know, and just what it, what do we mean when we say he's God man? What do we mean when we start talking about the hypostatic union? And then, he, you know, he goes through the whole sort of like early conciliar controversies at the beginning as well. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, that he spends, you know, what is this, four or five hundred pages? It's, a, it's, a, it's about five, six hundred pages. He spends just five hundred pages, five, six hundred pages talking about the hypostatic union. And that's before he even gets into the Christ created grace and redemptive deed. What all does he say when he, he's dealing with 500 pages of the hypostatic union? Not that you couldn't write 500 pages. I'm not saying it's, it's something easy. Clearly you can. Yeah. In fact, you probably write more. But I'm just curious, what all does he engage when he, when he does that? I mean, what are, what are the 500 pages made up of effectively? Well, part of it is after a shorter, shortish introduction, he spends, oh, I don't know, we'd have to look at the table of contents. Let's say 150, 200 pages going through the sort of the conciliar controversies and the historical development up okay. through about, let's say, Constantinople three, right? So the kind of the set one of the early Christological consensus in the late, by the late seventh century. Then he doubles back and starts over and then, or start over is the right term, but then he goes into like the speculative development of the mm -hmm. hypostatic and of and 
sort of like the interior logic of it. And that's the next 300 pages. And I'll talk about that a little bit. And then that paves the way for this discussion of the created graces, which equip Christ as a, you know, as an actor to perform his redemptive deed. And that's really what he's dealing with in this volume. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, this is a massive treatise between the two of them. If you, if you excise the Mariology, um, what is this? Um, I don't know, close to a thousand pages on Christ. Finally. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I have to say, Matthias Shaven is one of my favorite theological authors. And, you know, that's obviously why I wrote a dissertation on him. And, I'm, you know, working with Emmaus and with the translator, Michael J. Miller, to put this, help put this thing into English. Um, you know, he's not quite at the level of somebody like St. Augustine or St. Thomas. They're St. Bonaventure. They're completely top tier. He's a step below sure. them. Sure. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, this is one of the, and, you know, he's one of the great Catholic authors and dogmaticians of the last three, four centuries, since the great sort of like scholastic, Spanish scholastic Jesuits of the 17th century. And in particular, though, I mean, you know, his mysteries is quite beautiful. But for my money, I mean, the, the really killer volumes by him are on the one hand, his Doctrine of God, which we're putting out uh, next later this year or next year. But then also the two Christological volumes. I think this is the finest thing. We've got it in English now. This is the finest thing he's ever written. Mm. I think it's a stone cold classic. And uh, if I can just do a little, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Promotional. I think, you know, look, I think everybody should buy it. Yeah. So they're available on Amazon and they're available on Emmaus's website. Yeah. Okay, so what does he talk about here? What's going on in these vines? Let's, let's try and figure out what Shaven's getting at here. You know, he has certain central concerns that he's addressing in all of these pages. If I were to try and get at, like, what precisely is Shaven doing here? I would say this. First of all, he's writing this in Germany in the 1870s and 1880s. And they're awash in sort of, you know, what we could call, I guess, theological liberalism, liberal lives of Jesus and things like that. And what liberal lives of Jesus will do in various ways is they try and go behind the biblical texts, you know, these certain historical critical tools, and they'll try and reconstruct a figure of Jesus, which is a little more palatable, I guess, for modern man, a, a little more, he fits in a little bit better in sort of like modern liberal society, you know, what, however you want to phrase it, right? That's kind of going on in the background. And Shaben, he thinks that that truncates, you know, like is the mysteries of Christianity, right? He wants to preserve Christianity's supernatural dimension. That it's just not some, it's not just like a human existential. It's just not something that's like kind of exists within our world, but it's God erupting into our world and taking us back to himself. There's an epicletic action involved in Christianity, so to speak, where the Holy Spirit descends, where God acts, and he gives us something that, you know, we don't have virtualities for, you know, the city of God has to, you know, the city of God, the bride in Revelation 21 has to descend to give humanity his perfection, just as the Holy Spirit has to fall on Pentecost, and just as God has to act in the womb of the Blessed Virgin to bring about Christ. He has a totally different picture of Christ, and this is his counter-proposal. His counter-proposal proceeds along what I think what we could safely call a Cyrillian and Tomasian lines. Yeah. For Shaben, and you know, Shaben likes his concepts, but he also likes his metaphors, and he starts his Christology, he builds it out of a metaphor. Shaben likes the name Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. He likes the image of anointing, where you put some type of unction on a substrate. And he uses that as a point of departure to talk about Christ's composite constitution. And on the one hand, of course, the term Messiah has a long sort of like pre, like Jewish prehistory, right? The fulfillment of the Davidic promises and things like that. And of course, she even agrees with all of that. And he discusses Old Testament background, but he uses it as a way also to talk about sort of like a metaphysics as an entry point into a metaphysics of Christ's constitution. The unction refers to something very, very particular in Christ's case. You know, it's not just, you know, Samuel pouring oil down David's head or pouring oil down Saul's head. In any event, that's too extrinsic of an, of an example for what he has in mind, since the unction is actually constitutes, you know, the substrate under which the, you know, the substrate is grafted. But what he's trying to get at here is Shaben thinks, and he builds his whole Christology off of this idea, he thinks that the unction or the anointing agent, you know, the anointing oil, he thinks that that's what, you know, the high scholastics will call the grace of the union, grazia unionis. And that is the foundation of a speculative Christology for Matthias Shaben. That is not something that's a given these days, by the way. Um, 
I was reading not too not too long ago. I was reading, um, you know, if you want to pick on Carl Rahner a little bit, I was reading his Foundations of Christian Faith, and you know, you can look far and wide in it, and I, I, I'm not convinced that there's a grace of union in it. I ordered that book earlier today, by the way. Foundations of Christian Faith. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's yeah. A, have you read it before? No, I have not read it. Oh, you're but in I, for. But I've I've read about it, and therefore, yeah. no, you know, really- they they say it's his summa, so. Got to read it. <laughs> At least that's what they say. You could correct me if it's his Zoom or not, if you think it is. Rhonda's kind of a, well, let's get back to Shaven. Rhonda's kind of a, you know, he's an encyclopedist. His, you know, his theological investigations. I mean, he writes piecemeal things about topics, and that is his most condensed work that surveys a whole and in that sense it's a Mm. a systematic Mm. work but i think renarian's scholars have discussed the sense in which in what sense he has precisely like a you know summa theology Mm -hmm. you know shaven does have a sort of summa theology and that's his dogmatics and that's what we're discussing presently so what's the grace of union shaven thinks that this is the indispensable core foundation for any christology and he doesn't think and you know i'm inclined to agree with him by the he doesn't think you can do a Christology without this one idea. And the high scholastics use this term and, you know, like Thomas, and this would just be the explanation of what you see going on way back in Cyril, for example, and in the lead up to the councils of Ephesus and Chalcedon ultimately, you know, okay. The idea with the grace of union is that, and I should say on this point too, Tom, Shaven agrees very strongly with Thomas Aquinas on this point, and he disagrees, for example, with like Alexander of, H- of, of Hales, and, mm. for example, where the grace of union is some kind of created intermediate entity that disposes the humanity for union with the word. Mm. Shaven doesn't quite agree with that either. Shaven thinks that the grace of union, just as the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the Logos, insofar as he has assumed this humanity. Not just the Logos, because then that's just the second person of the Trinity, but the Logos insofar as he has become the proprietor of this nature and has taken this humanity to himself. And he becomes the agent, the principium quod operandi, the principle of action, the principle who acts. He becomes the agent operative in this humanity. Shaven interprets, uh, when he talks about the grace of union, he calls it, you know, he likes to use that unction, you know, metaphor. So he often calls it a substantial unction to indicate like the sort of the physical quality of the union. Um, He prefers subsistential unction, and he interprets hypostasis primarily in terms of subsistence, which refers essentially to the autonomy of the humanity exists in and for itself, but it doesn't exist in something else like an accident. Mm. For Shaven, there's no created intermediate entity between the Logos and the humanity. It just is the Logos assuming the humanity. Now, how how does that happen? Well, you know, that's what St. Cyril calls, you know, the ineffable union. Mm. We, 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 we don't know exactly what's going on down there in the thickets of this thing. Mm-hmm. How is it, you know, but, but that, that's what we see going on in Scripture, and that's what we're, theology is attempting to give an account for. It's, what, mm-hmm. it's the figure that we encounter in Scripture. Okay. Shaven just thinks that's how you have to do a, Christ, a speculative Christology. You can call it a Christology from above. You can call it whatever you want. But a, spec, a speculative Christology, Shaven thinks that that's how you have to do it. That's how you start there. And then everything else ramifies out from this one idea. Because if you don't start there, Shaben doesn't ever think you get back to it. And so, I mean, the alternative conception might be, well, you know, so we have like these created accidental graces and we have charity and we have, you know, faith or vision or whatever. And these are all, you know, super added to us as created persons. Well, but our existence as a concrete individual is presupposed to our receiving any of these sort of like accidental qualities. Mm-hmm. The grace of union is what establishes Christ in existence in the first place. And so there's nothing to receive, you know, these qualities until he's just taken the human nature to himself. But then the various graces overflow or redound into his humanity. And that's where we'll get to when we start to get into his treatise on his created grace. That's Shaven's central idea here, though, that he builds the whole thing off of. And he thinks that, so you, he doesn't think, for example, you ever get back to Christ if you take like, you know, like maybe I, if I'm in a state of grace, I think I am, maybe I have some created charity. And if you give me some more of it, and you give me some more of it, and you give me some more of it, Shaven doesn't think you eventually end up with Christ if you do that. Mm. He thinks that there is a difference not only in degree between Christ and us, and there is. Christ has more Christ has more charity than you and I do. He just does. Nevertheless, you know, his created charity is like our created charity, just more. But Shaven thinks there's not only a difference in degree, but there's a difference in kind. Mm. 
Christ's deification, Christ's engracement is something entirely different than what you and I are. We're created persons who are then elevated, you know, to face God as a new formal object. Okay, and then we come to a new knowledge of the one God as Trinity. And eventually, you know, if we attain to glory, we see him as he is. Well, that's great. And that is great, by the way. But Christ is something different altogether. He is the second person of the Blessed Trinity who has assumed a human nature. There's only one result in subject. That is the second, per you know, when Christ looks in the mirror, he goes, hi, I'm the second person of the Blessed Trinity. How are you doing today? I have assumed the human nature. That's the central idea. There is one subject here. Mm -hmm. And again, if you don't get there, Shaven thinks that there's a lot. It's, if you don't start there, Shaven thinks that there's a lot at stake here with this one idea. Because, you know, you ever drive around, you see those coexist bumper stickers? Yeah. yeah. And what do you notice? The T, the cross, is one letter among many. Right. Well, and this is a very sort of like, you know, kind of Schleiermachian idea of Jesus, where he is, you know, he might even be the biggest letter on the alphabet. He might be the most prominent, but ultimately he's, you know, you have all these other gurus, you have all these other sages, you know, you have the Beatles running over to India and finding their guru, you have this person and whatever. When Shaven looks around at all the world religions, he looks at the founder of this religion, the founder of this religion, the founder of this religion. He might look at all the Catholic saints. He might look at St. Teresa of Avila. You know, Teresa of Avila. He might look at St. Catherine of Siena. And I just finished reading Sigurd Unset's book on St. Catherine of Siena, and she is, it's, it's, it's a trip. Mm. You know, and you might look at St. Ignatius of Loyola and you whatever. And some of these people are holier than others. I'm pretty sure St. Ignatius of Loyola was holier than I am. Okay. So he differs from me in degree. Oh, but not in kind. When Shaban looks around at all of the panoply of world religions, when he looks around at all of their founders, all of this various sages, he looks around and he goes, right there. One of these things is not like the others. Mm. And that's, that's what the grace of union, that's what's at stake for him, is the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, the uniqueness of Christianity, the uniqueness of its revelation, not just as a word of God, but as the definitive word of God. It's just the word who's speaking. And he views the, you know, the kind of the grace of union as, as it's, you know, in substance articulated by like Thomas Aquinas is like really the sole conceptual explanation that does full justice to what's at stake, like with Cyril and the stories, and then in the lead up to the Council of Chalcedon and so forth. He thinks that this is the sole conceptual explanation that really does justice to the church's doctrine here. And he builds, and that's what he spends his whole, that kind of stuff is what he spends his whole first volume talking about. He, um, you know, he... He has, he has a very long systematic presentation on it. And after that, I mean, he actually has about, a, believe it or not, he has 100 plus, maybe even 150 pages on the communication of idioms. Because there's a, you know, he picks this up in Gregory Nazianzen, but there's a perichoresis, a, sort of a, a dancing in between the two natures, the divinity and the humanity. They, you know, they, co they come penetrate one another. And there's a certain, there's an exchange of attributes. You know, there's an exchange of terms that you can predicate that comes from that. And he spends a lot of time talking about that. And those are just different consequences then of the union. So that's what's the substance, at least, of, you know, there's more to it, but that's the substance of what's going on in volume five one. That's the point he's trying to establish. You said that <clears throat> the second person of the Trinity graced the humanity uh, of Christ. Did I understand that correctly? Um, we I don't know if I use that precise terminology, but yeah. I'm comfortable with that insofar as... So, you know, Shaban asks, for example, can we talk about, like, you know, the grace of union just like as a grace? You write the grace of union. He says, yes, asterisk. You have to recognize that it's different from like yours and my grace. It's different from, you know, like charity or whatever, or from sanctifying grace. But insofar as it's given freely to the humanity and it can't be merited, it is the greatest of all graces. Mm. No grace is less capable of being merited than the grace of union. You know, not only because it's supernatural, but because the grace of union, it, it, the, the, the subject that acts is formed by the grace of union. So there's no subject that can act without the grace of union. Mm -hmm. You can't merit it because there's no subject to merit until you, until the grace of union is established, until the actual unit of action has taken place. So it's just, it's simply impossible, not only because it's supernatural with respect to human nature, but it's simply impossible to merit because there's no act in subject until, until the unit of action takes place. So he would refer to it as a grace. Now, <clears throat> you said that this is basically the thing that, in in his opinion, that really explains the whole debate between Cyril and Nestorius. Is that correct? Yes. So, I mean, th this is not something that, you know, the Scholastics just kind of came up with. This is something rooted there in the early first millennium. 
it is the it is a conceptual articulation of the issues at stake between Cyril and Nestorius. But they don't use that term. I mean, what what do they generally? What does Cyril generally refer to it as? Well, Cyril argues. I mean, most of most of when when I've read their writings, a lot of it revolves around the communication of idioms, how you can predict mm-hmm. terms, and so like that, that's the whole thing with like the mother of God or the mother of Christ, right? Right. Can you right. say that God was born of the Virgin? Well, that's the. Well, Cyril thinks that you can because Mary gives birth to the person, not just to the nature. Right, right. And so that revolves around the communication of idioms. But Cyril's basic point that he's constantly fighting over is the issue of of there being a single subject, the incarnate Mm -hmm. word, you know, the second person who has assumed a human nature. There's one subject of whom you can predicate all of the actions and passions and things like that. Whereas Nestorius, and look, there's lots of literature debating what precisely Nestorius thinks, right? And some of his mm-hmm. later writings, the Book of Heraclitus, I think it's called, like he seems to like, maybe he's backpedaling, but he seems to downplay his positions a little bit. Okay. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, you know, I was reading McGuckin's great book on this last year. And um, there's that great line where Nestorius, he's, he wasn't actually at the Council of Ephesus, but he was in Ephesus and some of the bishops, I don't remember if it was Theodore of Ancyra, whoever it was, but he comes up to Nestorius and Nestorius just finally says like, look, I, and I'm pretty sure this is a direct quote, I refuse to acknowledge as God an infant of two or three months old. And the bishop goes, hmm. you know, he won't say that, you know, God, or he won't say that, you know, he he said he establishes he says the man is born of the virgin and he establishes what sounds to Cyril and it kind of sounds to me too to be honest mm-hmm. it sounds to Cyril like a second subject you have the man and then you have the indwelling logos and then right. all the sort of like the throne and temple analogies that Nestorius uses are all kind of like thrown off whack because like the temple analogies can be given a good sense in the biblical but you know what what's the manner of indwelling here well you know Shaven thinks that's the grace of union. That's the that's the first and fundamental form of indwelling in union, and that's what constitutes. I mean, he thinks that that's what's going on. That's what that's what accounts for what Cyril's talking about. So that's the idea there. So he views this as very very closely implicated in church church dogma. Now, in the second volume, towards the or yeah, right right at the beginning, he talks about the sanctification and deification of Christ's humanity. How can we speak about the sanctification and deification of Christ's humanity? Does that mean there was a period in time where his humanity wasn't deified, or in what sense is he speaking about this? Not that there was a period in time when his humanity wasn't like deified or sanctified, but there is a certain like conceptual like priority. Insofar as, you know, human nature in and of itself, you know, certainly doesn't have grace in and of itself. And it also certainly doesn't have the word in itself. And so he, you know, he fashions it and united himself to it. The humanity is generated precisely in the actual unit of action. He discusses all of that in book one. But he views that as a sanctification when it's taken up by the word. Not that his humanity was ever not sanctified or ever not holy or ever not united with the word from the moment of the union on. But nevertheless, it still is human nature, which in and of itself isn't holy, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's a certain logical priority in its assumption, which, you know, which traces it back to like the word. That's kind of what he's getting at there. You know, I remember Rahner was talking about the um, this issue here, but I, I forget where exactly he landed on it. But I remember it being somewhat controversial. Am I recalling things correctly? Can you maybe tell us? Uh, you know, contrast Shaven's view to Rahner here. Well, which, um, what, what, what pre- precise point do you have in mind, Rahner? So I, I don't I, recall off the top of my head. It, it almost sounded like he was saying that he he grew in his deification, but I could be completely misreading, and so yeah. I don't I don't want to misrepresent him at all. That's fair. But that's just the impression I got. But I could completely be missing the context of what was going on there. Yeah. Yeah. Rahner has a, just speaking about this briefly, since I didn't prepare this for tonight, mm-hmm. uh, and you'll, you'll see this if you read through the whole Christological section, which is probably like a good 200 pages of the foundations. Rahner has a completely different conception of the, of, well, I'm not even going to say hypostatic union, but he, he uses that term, I guess, But he, although he doesn't talk about grace of union. Yeah. He just views human nature as like the place where when God wants to speak, it takes the form of human nature. And then when God speaks maximally, you know, when God speaks completely, that's that's what that's when the that's that's when the hypostatic union occurs. But in you know the books downstairs are like a graphic, but you know, he has a passage where he explicitly says, you know, Christ can't be different from us in kind, only in degree. Mm-hmm. And that's the fundamentally different conception than what Shaven's arguing here. Because he's arguing that there's a difference not only in degree, which there is, but of kind also. 
he's just his deification is something different than ours because he's so, uncreated i guess well because it because it's the principle into which the humanity is grafted in is the uncreated principle of the word mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the initial sanctification of the humanity that shaven has in mind too is that just the grace of union and the uncreated you know humanity or excuse me the uncreated divinity of the word being united in the first place with the humanity even before he begins to talk about us uh, you know the same his christ or christ's various sanctifying graces and virtues and so forth that's where he picks up at the beginning of volume two and what he'll do then is he'll take like you know like the, the eastern fathers sort of like sword fire analogy and like the humanity will be the sword and then you plunge it into the fire well he'll describe the logos as like the fire but then, you know, when you put the sword in it, then it eventually it heats up and it begins to glow, like the heat and the light and things like that. That's the created graces, you know, that kind of like, that sort of like intrinsically modify the humanity. But they're sort of like a sort of an overflow or a redounding that flows out of the logos. And they're what shapes the humanity so that it can be a fit instrument for the word to act in. You know, because he needs, you know, he needs a certain intellectual knowledge and he needs a certain like, and he needs certain habits in his will so that his humanity can act in an appropriate way. And then those unforshaven unconditionally flow over into Christ's humanity. So, to, so as to make this, you know, a kind of a tool, an instrument, he likes instrumental, you know, he likes the instrument or organ language or conjoined instrument language, you know, that, that the word can use. Um, a couple of points on Christ's created grace. One, Shaben, and Shaben's very strong on this, and he's been, I mean, he's been criticized for aspects of this, but I agree with the substance of his position, at least. Um, he holds very strongly that Christ had the beatific vision from the moment of his conception, and that he had this draw his entire life. Now, that's super controversial today, right? I mean, there, there, was a, there was a consensus among this that emerged in the medieval period, and that lasted for a very long time, which has then kind of fallen to pieces in the last century, right? Um, there are authors today that do advocate for this. Um, most notably, like T.J. White makes like a barnstorming like, case for it in the, the Incarnate Lord, a wonderful book. Um, Simon Gaines argues for it in his book, Did the Savior See the Father? Now, you know, Gaines is moderately critical of Shaven in there in the sense that, I mean, he agrees where Shaven ends up, but he thinks that Shaven moves too quickly to the beatific vision, to Christ's beatific vision from the grace of union. Nevertheless, he does agree that Christ had the beatific vision. And, and Shaven's arguments actually, in, in a lot of ways, anticipate T.J. Weiss and the incarnate Lord. Uh, but, you know, Shaven, Shaven thinks that Christ always had the beatific vision. Um, and he thinks that that's an essential sort of like, kind of like corollary of the hypostatic union, you know, because for among other reasons, it's, it's so to speak, it's what tunes his mind up so that it knows like what the word is thinking so that it knows that it's the word. And so it sees itself in the word, because otherwise, if Christ walked by faith, then he would have to know the word just as something that he's, you know, he submits to, you know, in obedience and the darkness of faith and all of that. But then he would have to approach himself. I mean, Shaven thinks as a different subject. And so he would actually like bifurcate because, you know, the logos is intellect is just the divine intellect. And, you know, Christ's intellect I mean, he doesn't simply know by his divine intellect. He was saying Victor advocated that in the 12th centuries, and the scholastics universally reacted against that. Christ, I mean, Christ doesn't simply know by the divine intellect of the word. He has a created intellect, and that created intellect has to be transformed so that it can be an organ or instrument of the word. Well, Shaden thinks that the beatific vision is what does the job. And so he just talks as a sort of theandric form of consciousness that makes, you know, that, that's, that makes him the fit instrument. So that's his basic idea there. The, this human intellect, however, um, does Shaven talk about how this works, you know, especially in relation to scriptures that talk about him growing in wisdom and stature? Does he engage the uh, people who would say that, well, Jesus actually grew in knowledge? Yeah, he talks about all those passages. And his, so his basic idea with those passages is he just makes one or two points. One, that might be an outward and sort of like manifestation in knowledge, or it might refer to just an increased in like, you know, he has like a, he has a knowledge that he like experiential knowledge that he acquires as well. But he always behind all that, he always has the beatific knowledge. And so he would interpret those passages. He spends a couple of paragraphs talking about those. And he would interpret those in like one of those directions, for example. But then he'll also bring in like the slew of other biblical testimonies, especially in John's gospel, that talk about the Savior, just speak of the Savior as an eyewitness of heavenly things. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean? I mean, to be an eyewitness of, well, you know, God doesn't have a body, so it can't be something that you've taken from your senses. Well, is this some kind of infused concept? Well, you know, God is pure act. And so he, you know, it's, 
So what, what, what does it mean for him to be an eyewitness of heavenly things? You know, and he, Shaven doesn't think that infused prophetic knowledge is going to cut it. He thinks Christ is the beatific vision. No, look, you know, I don't know 100% how all of this, like, I, I, Christ's consciousness is in many respects very mysterious to me. You know, so for example, I think Jesus Christ knew my name when he was married in salvation for me on the cross. I do. But on the other hand, if I handed in my iPhone, could he unlock it? I actually don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> then he, well, this, this gets into tricky places if you really start to like think it through, right? Could he unlock my iPhone? Or, you know, and then they're going to argue, well, well why not? Well, on the one hand, you know, unless he sort of like has some sort of like, I mean, reserves I mean, how it flows his human out. intellect isn't going to be separated from his in the divine intellect so yeah yeah so so but on the, other hand, though, the objections against this are going to start going in the well you know it's tricky i mean the objections are going to start going to well this isn't then a credible historical figure right mm. but he's just playing a game with us you know he could sit there and speak mandarin chinese but he just chooses to speak you know aramaic or whatever and so maybe there's some sort of restriction in how it redounds and do as you say, you know, I don't know. But mm. so all of the details of that, you know, I'm not an expert on that. But Shaven does think that the root of everything Christ knows is just the beatific vision. And that's how he knows himself as the word. And that's how he becomes a coherent actor. Go ahead. Well, no, I was just going to make a comment and say it seems like the way Aquinas handled it was similar to what you said there, where he grew in in experiencing that knowledge in other words he he knew the things already objectively but mm -hmm. growing in the experience of them is is effectively what aquinas seems to advocate yeah and that sounds to me like the substance of shaven's position mm -hmm. yeah a uh, couple more points he thinks that christ was incapable of committing any sin and for a couple of reasons I mean, he's, he actually says at one point that it's his, he, it's his metaphysically impossible for Christ to sin as for God to sin. Hmm. Why would that be the case? Well, he thinks that it's not just because Christ has a lot of charity and not just because he has the beatific vision which fixes him on his last end, that too, but he thinks that he thinks that the principle of action here, the principium quod operandi, is the word, which is a divine person, and God can't sin. The principium quo operandi, the means by which he acts, the human nature, well, that's an instrument, but it's an instrument in the service of the person, and it's the person who places the acts. And so while human nature in and of itself, or a human will in and of itself is defectible, this person can't defect. He has, He's a divine person. God can't sin. He has no private good to defect back onto because his private good is just ultimately divine good. And so he thinks that Christ is utterly incapable of sin. He can experience sort of like, you know, he can have the matter of temptations presented to him as occasions for the exercise of virtue, but he can't actually, you know, I mean, he can't be seriously tempted to a sin in the sense that he would be like, hmm, I want to do this, et cetera, et cetera. Any kind of deviation like that. He thinks that Christ's actions have an, uh, have an infinite worth and that he can condignly merit anything, any grace whatsoever, I mean, he any the remission of any and or all sins, and this is what underlies the basis of his act of satisfaction too, and then also his merit of supernatural friendship on the cross. And the reason for this again is that since the principle that acts or who is acting is a divine person, his actions have a uniquely infinite value that outstrips the actual worth of the actions as created things. You know, so when Christ does this or when Christ does that, yeah, that action itself is a created thing. But he uses like the metaphor of like, you know, something being like perfumed with an unguent and the, the logos just, he, his dignity perfumes the actions and gives them more worth that they would have as created things because the person that does them is a divine person. So that's his, that's his basic idea there. And that's what he thinks is the foundation of Christ, all of Christ's merit is the, it's the dignity of the word. He has a very strong doctrine, and honestly, it's, an it's a very difficult section in places, but he has a very strong doctrine on uh, Christ as a conjoined instrument of the word. You know, and Thomas uses that language too, right? And the idea there simply is, um, you know, it's instrumental causality on the one hand. But, you know, for example, if I take a, you know, I take a hammer in my hand, that's a separate instrument. But now my hand... Well, that's a, that's a conjoined instrument, conjoined to my soul. And so this is an instrument, for example, of my soul or my will. Well, he thinks that the, a better analogy, for example, for what's going on with Christ's humanity as a whole, whether his body or his soul or his will, is that it's uh, the, whole, the totality of it is the conjoined instrument or organ, like in the modern sense, of the word. 
And, you know, just as, you know, I can sit here and I can write with my pen, for example, and I can write words, but a pen, you know, a pen is not intelligent. It's not rational. A pen is in and of itself isn't capable of a word. Nevertheless, you know, that's the power of instrumental causality. This can do more than it's capable of because I'm the efficient cause and I'm, you know, I'm rational. And so I can just, I can send like, you know, reason through this pen, so to speak. Well, Shaven thinks that Christ, you know, he, that, that this is what's true of the humanity of Jesus Christ as well. It's an instrument of supernatural effects which pass through it, just like motion through a hammer, just like a word through a pen, etc. And it's, it's the same thing with the sacraments, but in a higher sense in that it's more conjoined. So the, he actually thinks that he talks about it as like a high physical or even hyper physical instrument of the divinity through which, you know, he pours grace out into the world and things like that. Would, would a hand and glove analogy work or would that not be apropos? Well, the glo- let's think about that. You said word and pen. That, that's one I can, I can yeah. say. That, yeah. Well, I guess the motion would pass through the, the, the glove, but you don't really, the glove doesn't really add anything though either. You don't really use it and it's not. Mm. Mm. But he likes the he likes the like the like the hand, for example, as a conjoined instrument because it gets much to, it gets more to the physical union of the word with the humanity, mm-hmm. and which which is which is constantly you know the substantial or subsistential unction, as opposed to you know and his enemy here is the moral union. The moral union would be like you and I right now. You know we want to we want this podcast to be good and we want to teach people theology and maybe get them to read a little bit of shade. And so you and I have a unity of purpose right now, and that's wonderful. And that's a real thing, by the way, and that's great. But he's worried that if you start talking about, for example, there just being a moral unity between Jesus and the word and a union of two separate wills, which are an agreement of purpose, if that's all that you have, then he thinks that's just going to sound like two different subjects. So that's where he, when he tries to get into the physical unity language and stuff. That's what he's talking about is just the union of the humanity and the word. And, you know, then he also has his long treatise on redemption, which here, and he has a very strong doctrine of Paschal mystery the unity of dying and rising and accomplishing redemption. And really that's what I wrote my dissertation about was that portion, especially. I, you know, I may be getting it confused. Tell me the topic. I mean, the title of the dissertation again. Sure. The title is Christ and the altar fire. That's right. Yeah. I, purification. I, I remember there was some purification, a purification aspect to it. Okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, maybe talk about that specifically. I mean, if if it's engaging anything here, um, maybe talk a little bit about that if you don't mind briefly. Sure. Yeah, the principle. Um, well, I use all of Shapen's dogmatics. The principal materials I'm working from in that work are dogmatics five one and five two, and then all the soteriological portions are right here in dogmatics five two. Mm-hmm. And so the the principal thing I'm looking at in that work is I'm looking at Shapen's theology of sacrifice, but which has strong Christological implications once you dial everything back. And Shaben's idea of sacrifices, um, let me think how to do this in a not excessively technical fashion. So the way I structure the dissertation, I look at it, I, I look at his theology of sacrifice primarily through his use of a biblical metaphor. And then that eventually dials back into his Christology, though, as we'll see in just a second. And that biblical metaphor is the, the figure of the fire on the Old Testament altar. If you go to like the book of Leviticus, and if you look at the, you know, the construction of the tent, mm-hmm. and if, you know, Israel's outdoor altar, which was in front of the tent of Medan slash later the temple, it's not like a table like you'd see in a Catholic church. It's a fire pit, and it's got a grill in it, and then they would burn animals on it. And at the ordination of Aaron and his sons in Leviticus chapter 8, you know, and then in Leviticus chapter 9, they inaugurate the cult. Well, they start burning the gifts on the altar, but then, you know, the Shekinah or the glory of God, the pillar of cloud and fire, the luminous cloud descends onto the tent. And then it shoots forth fire to accept the gifts. And then the fire burns on the altar and that burns up the gifts. And then they rise up as, you know, what scripture calls like in the Vulgate, an order, an order suavitatis, an order of sweetness. Mm. And that's, that's, that symbolizes the divine acceptance of the sacrifice. And Shaven, what he's looking at is what is the significance of ritual burning in the Old Testament cultic rites? Because, you know, there's a lot of talk about like in literature, there's a lot of talk about the slaughter of the animal. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of talk about the blood manipulations, you know, whether they sprinkle it or dash it against the altar or in Yom Kippur, right? In Leviticus 16, they bring it into the Holy of Holies. And, and that's that imagery is taken up in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 9. Well, 
this was a this was a problem in Shaven's day, and it's a problem in our own day. In, in, in discussions of cultic sacrifice, there's often very little discussion of the actual action of ritual burning. And there are some people today that are remedying that. Really, really good works are like the works of Christian Ebernhardt. I think he's a he might be a Lutheran, but he's got a number of really good works on this. And his dissertation, his doctor, German doctoral dissertation, is on this. Um, L. Michael Morales has a wonderful book. Um, well, it's right here. I forget what it's called, but this is a really good book too. Who shall ascend the mountain of the Lord? Um, so if he ever gets if he ever gets back to him, I guess I'm promoting his book now too. But you know, I agree with the substance of what he writes in this book, though it's great, and it's 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 very very converging with what Matthias Shaven is arguing. And there are scholars today who argue for this. You can see traces of it in Jacob Milgram. But what they look at is in sacrifices. First of all, not just like not any sort of like just the central to define an act as being like the slaughter. And, and there's difficulties with making like the slaughter this you know like the, the, the primary focus, and we do that because of like the crucifixion, right? Christians right. do this because of the crucifixion. Right. This is a sacrifice. This is the slaughter of Christ. This is the slaughter of the animal. Great, but the difficulty is that in the Old Testament, I mean, the the slaughter of the victim is not a heretic or priestly act per se. It can be performed by the layman or by his, if he has like a slave or something as his delegate, it can be performed later on in the cult by a Levite. And if a priest does do it, I mean, he's he's essentially functioning not as a representative of God, but as a representative of the layman performing his duty. So the actual slaughter itself isn't a heretic or priestly act. Okay. You know, and then the various blood manipulations are important too, but you know, what Shaven's question is what, you know, in, 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 in terms of remission of sins, but what about the fire that's burning on the altar? Mm-hmm. You know, in, in, in the sin offerings, only a portion of it's burnt. In the burnt offering, all of it's burnt. And then token portions of it are burnt with the various peace offerings. Well, you know, the divinely given fire, what's this all about? And Shaven takes that fire as a type in the Old Testament for a New Testament reality or as a whole concatenation or chain of New Testament realities. Mm-hmm. In particular, grace, charity, and glory. And so the animals, God never wanted the animals, right? And then the various grain offerings, those are stand-ins, which are then substituted for like the human offering in the New Testament again. So ultimately, Michael, you are the victim that God wants, Mm. but he doesn't per se want to destroy you. I mean, he might destroy you a little bit if you catch my drift, right? But Mm. that's not ultimately what he wants. The object of sacrifice is the rich, you know, the object is union with God and the ritual burning. Yes, it, you know, it breaks you down. But then it also converts you into smoke so you can rise up into a higher condition. Because scripture always talks about an odor pleasing to the Lord. That's and what that with the, the yeah, it, it originates in Exodus 29 when they're talking yeah. about incense burning. And then it shows up in various cultic contexts when they talk about ritual burning and its fruit. And it's and the Shaven jumps all over this text. It's used in Ephesians 5, 2 to talk about Christ's passion, which arises from his love. And then the principle of, you know, by which Christ offers himself is actually what makes his sacrifice erratic is actually his charity. Hmm. And so Shaven doesn't think Christ's sacrifice is a sacrifice insofar as it's, a, you know, insofar as, it, you know, it's, he's being attacked by the Romans or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. just as, you know, the heretic action, I mean, the slaughter in the Old Testament wasn't a heretic action. He thinks that it's a ritual burning in the form of realized eschatology inside of Jesus Christ and the sacred altar fire is what's actually breaking him down and compelling him to endure these sufferings. And that's what gives value to all of these actions, not because he's being like, you know, killed by the Romans in a public state execution or whatever and betrayed by his countrymen. That does not a sacred work make for Shaven. Now it's going to get a little more complicated here, but 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 the, the real quick takeaway though is that, and this is what brings in his Paschal mystery theology though too, is that it's about, you know, the slaughter but then it's also about the rise and up, which is fulfilled in the resurrection and they form a joint action. And that's mm-hmm. the total redemptive arc is dying to one condition and then rising into another. And, and the role of offering the sacrificial victim, where, where does that also play in this? Well, when you offer something, you give it to the priest so that he can do, you know, so that he can, he can ultimately dispose of it heretically um, so that he can, he can dispose of it in the cult. Well, but the priest is the mediator. You bring your gift to the temple, but you give it to the priest, but he's the person that's authorized to approach the altar or to go into the sanctuary. So he completes. Well, I mean, offering to God, you know, presenting the sacrificial victim and offering to God in the, in the way that, I mean, we offer the Eucharistic species, the priest offers it mm-hmm. to God. Um, is is that an essential function too when it comes to this the atoning aspect? Well, it is. But I mean, but the offering is the the idea there is like the the is, is in, in the Old Testament right, it says the bringing forward or the procurement of the gift and bringing it to the sanctuary, for example. And then we use that language sort of like in a transfer sense when we talk about like our spiritual acts of offering. Mm. 
But the idea there is some kind of donation to God, and that's what produces the ritual matter that's acted on by the divine fire. Mm. Now, where, where this is going to, so we'll come back to Christ in just a second. So where this gets a little tricky. So Michael, you're the you're, you're the thing that's offered. You're the sacrificial mm-hmm. victim. Mm-hmm. And if you're in a state of grace right now, for example, I mean, mm-hmm. you're becoming a pneumatic sacrifice that's just being consumed by like grace and infused virtue. And that's, you know, you're dying to self, but then you're also virtue perfects. And so then you're actually rising up to God in the process. And then that'll be completed in the last day in the resurrection. Mm-hmm. And all of this is mediated through Christ's passion. But then Shaban's basic idea then is that, you know, God, the divine fire is the logos is grace of union. And that's the fire, for example, that burns in the pillar of cloud and fire. Because and I was that, actually going to ask you about that next, because God is described as a, as a pillar of fire. At least it, it seems the, uh, the second person may have been described that way in the Old Testament. Um, and you know, where so does the sacrificial fire on the altar come from? Well, it shoots forth from the glory of God mm. that descends onto the tent. So Christ mm. is, he, he's the fire inside the pillar of cloud and fire, the 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 his humanity is the cloud and then the fire within is the hidden divinity. And then the fire shoots forth and it consumes the gifts. And that's the Holy, that's the Holy spirit being given to the church on Pentecost. That's the Holy spirit flowing out of Christ's side in the form of blood and water. That's the Holy spirit descended in tongues of fire. And then that's, you know, transforming those, that's the Holy spirit transforming you by his created gifts, turning you into a pneumatic offering. That's the, that's the basic idea there. And what what about the fire also burning on the candles there in, in the tabernacle and, also in the temple, does that pertain also to this idea of uh, sacrifice and fire? Well, I mean, so on the one hand, like the offering of, in the Catholic Church, he discusses this, the offering of candles and incense at this point are sort of like adjunct offerings that they've been kind of subordinated. And so it's not like when you offered incense as a, like a, as a primary sacrifice in like the holy place, for example, of the Old Testament, these things have been subordinated to the Eucharist. And so they just are kind of accompaniments at this point. But on the other hand, I mean, you know, he doesn't quite say this, but I'll go ahead and say it. I mean, you know, the, on, uh, at Paschal Vigil, you know, you have the new fire, you light the big candle from it. Okay, that's Christ's resurrection. And then he's the big, that's the pillar and fire now leading us through the wilderness. Mm-hmm. It's not even all of the Exodus motifs. And what do we do? Well, we're the little candles. That's our sort of accidental deification. Christ is the big candle. That's the hypostatic union. And then you have the fire flowing out from it where we light our candles from it. And that's Christ deifying us through his save and sacrifice. You know, and then he's got, a, and then he has a whole discussion too about. I mean, I mean, for for Shaban, the 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 tone and merit of Christ's sacrifice, where he actually, you know, he he merits, you know, that merit we were talking about, he merits forgiveness of our sins, but then he also, you know, he also merits supernatural friendship with God. All of that is summarized for Shaban on the cross, and that's the sacrifice par excellence. You know, when he's just, it's all being offered up in the fire of his charity. That's when he's married in the salvation of the world. And then he, he goes into a distributive efficacy in his resurrection when he begins to confer it. Mm. So that would be like the fire coming out of the, you know, the, mm. out of the pastel candle, that kind of thing. No, he, he also, I think, talk, talks a little bit about the propitiatory aspect to the sacrifice of Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, who or what is he propitiating? Is it the wrath of God? What What's going on here on the cross? Because there have been different theories that have been proposed when it comes to the atonement that God, he poured out his wrath. You know, this is generally a reformed perspective. Um, could you maybe comment on that? How does a Catholic understand propitiation? Well, so he's removing the wrath. I mean, he's, he's taken away the wrath of God, but we, so this gets a little tricky because we have to start to talk about Anselmian satisfaction theory to get into this and then kind of what Shaven does with that. Mm. Um, Shaven does not, I mean, Anselm might say this, but he goes, he follows Thomas Aquinas' modification of Anselm satisfaction theory. And that's in uh, Summa Theologiae Tertia Pars, question 46, uh, maybe article three, somewhere in there. Okay. Um, but Shaban does not hold to any kind of like strict penal substitution theory where, you know, Christ is like the lightning rod, for example, that's taken on the punishment so that, you know, the, now that the punishment has been satisfied, like we don't have to take that and he's a substitute victim. That's not quite what he thinks is going on. Um, for Shaban, and he follows Thomas Aquinas here, is, is, is Thomas amends Anselm's satisfaction theory. Thomas doesn't think that. God has to, for example, because in, in Anselm, we do strongly get the sense that God, you know, if he either he has to punish you or he has to get satisfaction, but this, you know, this, this debt of punishment has to be paid. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And 
Thomas just thinks that God can forgive any offense if he wants to do so without disrupting like the beauty of order in the cosmos. Now, it may or may not be more fitting to do so, but he can do it if he wants to. And the reason is that Thomas says is that all sin is a personal offense against God. Mm-hmm. You know, if if I go and I hit you with my car, you know, if I go and I run you over with my car and then you sue me, you know, and we go before a judge, the judge can't just, you know, just can't say, you know, Michael, I'm sorry, that's too bad, but I'm going to forgive David because that wouldn't be just. Correct. But if I walk up and if I, if I hit you with my car and then I walk up to you and you go, I forgive you, you're, you're free to forgive anybody you want. Mm. And what, he, what he's saying is that what Thomas is getting at is that all sin is ultimately a personal offense against God. You know, Psalm 51, David, you know, oh, you know, who, against you alone have I sinned. It's like, well, what about Uriah, the Hittite? Right. You know? <laughs> right. you know, or your Joseph with like Pharaoh, you know, Potiphar's wife, you know, and yeah. he's like, I'm not going to sin against God. Well, what about Potiphar? You know, what, you know, what about Potiphar? And so the idea there is that God can forgive any offense he wants. Um, and so he doesn't like need to have his wrath satisfied. But if he in fact is making satisfaction for sins and is offering something up that does offset the dishonor that's been shown to him, it's not just because like a certain debt of punishment needs to be paid, but because A, Christ is you know super abundantly honoring God, but B, that also produces certain like dispositions in our souls and gives us an incitement to virtue. And then also C, Christ is producing certain patterns in him that have to repro- be reproduced in us where we die to selves and then rise again to God. And Sh- Shaban views it more along those lines. Christ is undergoing certain exemplary states, which he's going to then reproduce in us as we move away from sin and then are transformed by grace. Mm-hmm. But, you know, as long as... Well, how, how to put this? I mean, A, we never do enough satisfaction anyways. I mean, Christ is t- taken on the full, and then we just do our little penances, right? And then those are enough because Christ has done it. But the, the, the Shaven's, what Shaven is principally getting at here is that this isn't like a penal substitution theory. This is just, this is what happens when you, you know, just as the same sun, it like, you know, it, it'll like, it'll, if something's dry, it'll set it on fire. If something's like in the right conditions, it'll grow. The same sun acts differently on things. Well, we mirror God's punishment when we sin. But then also when he confers his grace, then, you know, then we flourish and so forth. And it's just God acting on us in different ways, but it just depends on how we're disposed to receive his action. Well, Christ is just, you know, what he's doing is he's just, he's given us an example, but an efficacious example, which, which, you know, helps us to die to sin, gives us, you know, gives us an example, but then also helps, gives us the graces also to, you know, perform our own satisfaction and to die to self and then to move away from sin. And so then, then to be transformed. So that's the kind of the gist of what he, I mean, I'm doing this too quickly, but that's the gist of what he's doing there. So. Did, did he merit anything on, on the cross? Christ? Yeah. Yes, both for mm-hmm. himself and for others. So it's not, you know, and I'm not saying you said this, but just to oh. clarify for people who misunderstand. Sure. It's not just him serving as an example for us on the not cross. Not just He's example. meriting as well. No, that's correct. Okay. He is an example, but he's not just an example. Right. He also right. merits the grace by which we die to ourselves and then rise to God. And he's also the organ through which those graces are being, you know, transferred mm. to our souls. Mm. So he's all of those things at once for Shaven. So he's got a multi kind of stacked theory of the atonement where all of this yeah. stuff is going on at once. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, did did you have anything else that you wanted to talk about when it comes to Christology before we just take uh, uh you know, just a little look at his perspective on Mary? I think that'll do it for right now. We only got a few minutes left, so we can jump into the Mariology a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, I think one thing that a lot, there's actually going to be two things that yes. our, our viewers, but take it wherever you want to go. Okay. Um, there's going to be two things that our viewers are really going to want to focus on. Um, the Immaculate Conception and also where does he land on this idea of co redemptrix But again, if you want to take it somewhere else, that's, that's perfectly fine. Okay. I didn't prepare the Mariological material as much for this as I did the Christological yeah. material. So I, I will just make a couple of points. You know, the Immaculate sure. Conception had been defined in the 1850s, and he's writing the relevant materials here in the early 1880s. And so this is this is very directly on his mind. And, he, and, mm. and without going into all the details of it, he does have an extended section, we argue, very strongly for the Immaculate Conception. And then he also mm. goes through the whole complicated history of its development. Mm. On co-redemptrix issues, I actually thought you were going to ask me that, so I did just flip through a couple of passages real quick. Um, he has a very strong emphasis on Mary being um, the mediatrix of all graces. And he uses that term, for example, in paragraph, uh, this thing's subdivided into paragraphs. He uses that in paragraph 1776. In par- one point, though, and, and he thinks that, you know, Mary at the foot of the cross and all of that is, you know, 
suffering along, you know, the compassion, right? She's suffering along with Christ and for the salvation of the world in her own way. Um, he does express some slight reservations in paragraph 1775 about the actual term co-redemptrix. He thinks it can be given a good sense. His only, and you know, he has a very strong doctrine of Mary's compassion and that, you know, she's a mediatrix of all graces, but his slight concern with co-redemptrix is that the way it's actually phrased, he's worried that it doesn't, he, what he hears is Mary being coordinated with Christ rather than subordinated to Christ. Mm -hmm. And so that's his only slight concern mm -hmm. with the actual term. So he uses it, but he has a few asterisks on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't that kind of what we see from, you know, several popes lately? Not just the current pontificate, but previous popes, where they say there's some truth to the under the the term co-redemptrix, but it's not a very good term. Um, yeah, is that it, kind it, of what he's getting at? Yeah, and it defends Protestants. Yeah. And, and on the one hand, if you know that might just be the nature of the beast, because if they don't like the doctrine, but on the other hand, you don't also want to give undue offense. Right. Yeah, not you know if if we could maybe communicate the same truth, but in yeah. another way that doesn't yeah. the the semantics of it isn't going to matter at that point as long as we're substantially communicating the same thing. So I think that's kind of what they were getting at is that there's a truth here substantially that we need to affirm, but the way the terminology that we're using isn't necessarily the best. Yeah, but on the other hand, now you know I. On the other hand, though, what I just said, you know, Shaven is not excessively concerned about satisfying, like, you know, kind of like Protestant scruples, you know, or whatever. And his, mm -hmm. his Mariology would probably make, um, I mean, he would make many a hot Protestant's hair stand on him. <laughs> <laughs> he has an extremely exalted doctrine of the mother of God, you know, the okay. like, dint of her relationship to her son. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, honestly, this is probably one of the finest Mariologies ever written. Um, mm -hmm. And so... Yeah, yeah. So I guess we have my initial thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, any any final comments there before I get to the chat questions? Yeah, I will just say this is just a very general comment. And look, this is just one man's opinion, right? You can take it or leave it. I think that this is as taken as a whole is one of the finest works of theology. These two, and the whole dogmatics, really, but these two volumes in particular are one of the finest works of theology produced in Catholic modernity. Mm. I, I, it's difficult for me to stress like the impact that over the, I started reading these volumes back in 2013. It's difficult for me to stress the impact they've had on me personally over the last probably seven or eight years in my theological formation. And look, I mean, there, there, there are difficult reading passages. And in some of the small print passages, when he really gets into the weeds, you know, it can be a little difficult to follow for the modern reader who's not familiar with the state of the question. Nevertheless, if you dive into it, you will be richly rewarded. This is one of the richest treaties in Christology that's probably ever been produced in the Catholic Church. Mm. Now, um, you know, but but is 5.1 really a necessary prerequisite for 5.2, or could you read this as a standalone volume? You can read it as a standalone volume, but you are jumping in right into the middle. But on the mm -hmm. other hand, I mean, 5.1 five, five is just his dogma of the hypostatic union and then the Christological controversies, where you pick up just right in the opening page of 5.2. He's just talking about, okay, let's talk about Christ's created grace. And then he just takes off right from there. And then he goes into the redemption after that. Uh, somebody's asking, what's the name of the volume series? Handbook of Catholic yeah. Dogmatics, Matthias Shaven, yep. Joseph Shaven. Yeah, the Handbook so. of Catholic Dogmatics. And then there's like, this is like part, uh, book five, the Soteriology, mm -hmm. part two. There's also part one. Um, so it's going to be out in, a, in English in a total of eight volumes. And we also have the theological epistemology. That's these two volumes out. Yeah. So there's a grand total of four of the eight volumes out. The Doctrine of God is done, and it'll be at press. Um, I can't speak to Emmaus's like publishing deadlines, but sometime within the next year. And production's already begun on the Doctrine of Creation as well. And the reason why y'all skipped from one to five was to make sure to get the Christology because that was so central. Is that yeah. correct? Well, yeah, we just wanted to get this put into English sooner than later. We're planning on doing all of it, but. Mm -hmm. this is just this is these are probably the most important volumes and so we just mm -hmm. wanted to kind of jump to the end and then move back and do the middle mm -hmm. or at least that was the that was the rationale I think. yeah uh same question asked for someone not familiar with theology i don't have a degree in theology how approachable are said volumes well that's a so i want to encourage and discourage at the same time here so let me try and phrase this just a little carefully Shaven has more accessible works than this. Um, for example, he's got, this is a more accessible work, The Mysteries of Christianity. Mm 
this was written for an educated lay audience. And this is this is a reasonably, it's, it's work, but it's a reasonably accessible work. This is also one of the most fantastically beautiful books I've ever read. This would be a great place to start if you just wanted to you know, get a feel for his theology. The dogmatics is very, it's, it's very demanding in places. Um, there's large print paragraphs and small print paragraphs. The small print paragraphs where he provides support and argumentation, arguments, documentation, he kind of gets into the thicket a little bit, it gets into fine tuned metaphysical questions. The, the small print paragraphs are harder to read than the large print paragraphs, and they can sometimes be incredibly technical. That being said, I mean, I, I, I would encourage anybody to read it that can at least try to read it, and I think you'll get something out of it. I would rather understand 30% of a great book than you know 80% of a bad book. But, but in answer to your question though, is the dogmatics, they are technically demand in volumes. They do ask a lot of their readers. So I'm not gonna sugarcoat that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> somebody's asking, is Shaven with the Thomist position that the humanity of Christ derives its existence, supposing a real essence existence dis distinction, solely from the divine logos, like it does its personhood? Oh, so is that the question of how many acts of existence are in Christ? It sounds like it, yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, Shaven deals with that in one of his small print paragraphs, and if I recall correctly, here was his answer. He says, you know, this is a very technical, not all technical questions he feels he needs to resolve, depending on what he thinks is at stake theologically. And if I recall correctly, he decided that however precisely we, you know, cut this up, I mean, not every aspect of this has to be and necessarily can be resolved. But he doesn't think that there's two acts of existence because that would be, have two supposits and then that you would have the logos and then the man and that would incline to Nestorianism. So he's going to be closer to there just being like one act of existence. But the difficulty is you can't just, it's hard to say that you just have one because that would just be God. Mm. And the, obviously, you know, there's, he's assumed this humanity. So I think Shaven's answer to it, insofar as he answers, it would be like a one with an asterisk. Hmm. So I'm working off the top of my head there, but that's what I recall from when I read that passage. Lower Lai, one of our patrons says, or asks, if Christ is perfect in both his natures, how can he gain merit? Great question. Shaven addresses this extensively and at length. So I'm going to answer your question in two ways. On the one hand, he merits for others. Mm. Or again, he merits for his mystical body of which he is the head. Mm. And in that sense, not, not, not too much of a problem. What about Christ meriting for himself? I mean, that sounds like that would run counter to one of the, actually Cyril's like anathemas, I think, if I recall correctly, or one of the anathemas from the Council of Ephesus or whatever. How can Christ merit for himself? And the answer, Shaven's answer, that, answer to that is as follows. On the one hand, Christ has a due as the Son of God to the complete glorification of his humanity. And if he had wanted to, he doesn't for um, economic reasons or for soteriological reasons for our salvation. If he'd wanted to, he could have assumed a completely glorified humanity right at the first moment of his existence. And in fact, by rights, he probably should have. However, without prescinding from any of his sort of like higher intellectual perfections, without it becoming capable of sin, he does take on the ability to suffer and he does assume passable humanity for our salvation. And then he gives up something which is his by right so that he can subsequently merit it. Well, but that's because he's able to merit then for himself because he has voluntarily set aside something which is his, but it's not merit in the strict sense because it's already due to him, but he's, he's basically married in something that he already owns. This one is from uh, Dr. DeClue. He, uh, there it is. Uh, congratulations on your defense. Dr. May I ask who compromised your dissertation board? I'm guessing Dr. Root uh, must have been one of them. He was one of my readers. <laughs> well, I hope none of my readers compromised it, but I'm giving you a hard time. Um, it was comprised of my director was Dr. Reinhard Hooter. And then my other readers were Chad Pecknold and indeed Michael Root. Michael Root is Michael Root's a Shaven fan, and him and Bruce Marshall, they've been reading Shaven together since before it was cool. <laughs> and Bruce Marshall, actually, he's at Southern Methodist University. He um he actually wrote the introduction to Dogmatics 5.1 as well. And then our good friend Father Thomas Joseph White at the Angelicum, he wrote the introduction to 5.2. Oh, go ahead. Uh, did you have anything else there? That's it. Well, well, I hope no one compromised it. 
Um, th this one is from Father Luke. Uh, does Shaban address the usage of prospon versus hypostasis in ancient Christological controversy? Oh, he does, but I don't remember exactly what passage. It's going to be in 5.1, and that's, he's got a whole section on the terminology. Um, mm -hmm. If you give me 13 seconds, I might even be able to tell you what section. Yeah, 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 yeah no rush. And Dr. DeClue did clarify he meant comprised. I should have got that. No. <laughs> Usually and I, I do correct typos. I was giving, typos I was giving Dr. DeClue up. I was giving him a gentle look. Right. <laughs> So the section I would probably check would be section 220. Um, the dogmatic formulas and concepts for the elements and form of Christ's constitution. Hypostasis equals suppositum or subsistence and person essence and nature, hypostatic or person, et cetera. That's where he goes into all of the terminology. And I'm confident he discusses the ancient, um, you know, and he might even do that in sort of the historical portion too, because there's, there's a terminological development to use in the East, right? Mm -hmm. But that's probably in section 220 would be where he would discuss his terminology most expressly. Yeah. Um, I don't see any others. So did, did you have any concluding thoughts, final things that you wanted to get out there? I'll just say one final thing. And this is more of an aesthetic point. You know, Hans Urs von Balthasar is kind of like one of the great theologians of, you know, God's beauty and of just, you know, the, you know, the attribute beauty, right? In the first like third of his uh, trilogy and so forth, the theoesthetics. Mm. You know, and I actually was introduced to me. I discovered Matthias Shave and read Hans Urs on Balthazar's Theological Aesthetics, Volume One, around page mm. 100 to 110, give or take. In there, he's got about a 10 to 12 page survey of Shaven and mm. kind of his like loose history of theological aesthetics in the modern period. And that was where I was first introduced to Shaven. I was reading, it, I said, I love this. I said Balthazar down. I started grabbing Shaven, and then you know here we are today, right? Mm. Um, Shaven's. And actually, I'm I'm doing the index right now for his doctrine of God, and there's a, there's dozens and dozens of references to the divine beauty in there, and he actually gives it a treatment as a separate attribute, which is not always common in treatises on God. I don't recall there being a you know a, 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 you know a question on divine beauty per se in the Summa Theologiae, for example. Um, Shaven's theology is incredibly beautiful, and yes, it can get a little tangled in some of the small print paragraphs, but. Shaman has a very, he's, he's a good reader of the fathers and he's a good reader of scripture. And he always dials his, you know, his, his longer conceptual discussions back to various sort of like scriptural metaphors, whether it's anointing, whether it's, you know, different, different scriptural analogies. And this gives us sort of like a color and a hue to his theology, which really makes it lovely. And one of the distinguishing characters of his thoughts is his constant interplay between concept and metaphor. But this is constantly bringing it back into the dialogue with the fathers and with more to sort of like the primordial origins of the faith, you know, like in scripture and so forth. He's a, he can be, when he wants to be, an incredibly he can, dense at times, but an incredibly beautiful theolo theologian. So these volumes are available on Emmaus's website or on Amazon, and let's go from there. Yeah, excellent. Well, Dr. Augustine, again, congratulations on your degree. I, uh, okay. you know, I, I know you look forward to May. And, yeah. um, you know, receiving it officially. But like I said, we're going to go ahead and call you Dr. Augustine because sure. you've earned it. So again, congratulations. I appreciate you coming on and doing this. You're welcome to come on anytime, talk about any of the other volumes if you would like. Yeah, let's think about that. Yeah. Um, we'll, 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 we'll touch base via email. Yeah, indeed. indeed. All right. Well, everybody, I appreciate y'all also watching and commenting there in the chat. Thank you for your questions, and I appreciate the participation. Don't forget to, of course, like and subscribe, and also share or check us out, I should say, patreon.com forward slash reason of theology if you want to support us. Until next time.